We are continuing our study in the book of Acts. Uh, we are going uh, verse by verse and line by line. Uh, that's the way I like to do it and the way I believe uh, God uh, wants me to do it personally. Today I want to talk to you about farewell to friends. Farewell to friends. And let me, give, let me say that first because Steve said something to me. Somebody might think you're leaving. All I'm doing is preaching a text, okay? This has nothing to do with me. All right, don't you worry about that. Uh, we are going to stay here. Uh, my goal is till I retire. That is my goal. And hopefully the Lord will see it uh, to that. Let me give you the outline on farewell to friends. Uh, if you have a bulletin there, you can follow along with us. Number one, a review of the past. A review of the past. Number two, a testimony of the present. A review of the past and a testimony of the present. And if you're sharp on your feet today, a warning about the future. You already knew that one, all right? Past, present, and future. And for all those who lost the sleep and you're a little groggy today, you, bet you should thank God we're not in a two-story building, all right? Because last week, we preached on a kid falling out that window when he fell asleep. So if I were you, I would still stay awake if I were you, okay? <laughs> it is truly amazing everything Paul has been through up to this point in his ministry. People were being saved, churches were being planted, miracles were being done, and there was a lot of discipleship going on. There was also much persecution, even arrest and beatings and hate from his own countrymen. Through it all, Paul never wavered never doubted God, and never wanted to quit the ministry. Folks, that tells you something about Paul. He was undoubtedly one of the best church leaders this world has ever seen. If he was alive today, Paul would be one of the most sought-after church growth experts in all the world. His ministry success flowed, flowed from his devotion to truth. He loved the Word of God. He preached the Word of God. His moral and spiritual character were outstanding. His commitment to God was amazing, and he definitely was a man of prayer. He constantly looked at his own life and ministry from God's point of view. And folks, sometimes we need to do that in our own lives. Our text today is Paul introspecting his ministry and his life. Uh, to evaluate any life or ministry, you have to look at the past, the present, and the future. So let, let's look at this text, Paul penned from God. And I will say, this scripture is the peak, the, the high point of the book of Acts. You can see everything that Paul is and was, and uh, his mindset, his determination to go on. You can see this in the text that we are about to read and teach. Farewell to friends, Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, uh, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And you remember, he was backtracking over all the churches he had been to. And there was a twofold purpose in that. He was discipling the churches and the Christians there, but he was also taking an offering for the, for the Jerusalem church because there had been much persecution and his goal, if you remember, when he started this, and we said, was journeying to Jerusalem. So, instead of stopping at Ephesus, and the reason was because of time. He was trying to get to Pentecost. He wanted to be there, which was 50 days uh, after uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And, and he just wanted to be there uh, to celebrate that time with his brothers and sisters in Christ. So he sent, and the the uh, folks at Ephesus came. And by the way, the word elders, you know, I, I've done you know, several studies on this, and elders, in my interpretation, is not deacons, okay? Deacons have a separate set that it says in uh, 2 Timothy 3, the, the role of a deacon. Elders are church leaders. You can use the word pastor, you can use the word overseer, and even in some places you see the word bishop, okay? Now, personally, I'm not comfortable with bishop 
you call me one of two things, Brother Mike, all right? I like Brother Mike, or, and a lot of people, some people, excuse me, call me Pastor Franklin. Either one is fine, but it's simply saying these were not deacons. These were church leaders. These were the people that were going to take Paul's place. These were the people that had uh, showed maturity in their walk with the Lord. And they had leadership ability, and, and Paul was doing it one more time. He's going back through there one more time to pour this last bit of his life into them. Then in verse 18, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And folks, he gives you his motive, why he was doing what he was doing. And first, folks, it was the love for the Lord. It was his call to the ministry. It was what the Word of God was teaching. And Paul was doing that. And look what he says. Uh, an important part of that in leadership is humility. All right, humility. Folks, we don't need to be proud. We don't need to... It, it's like... Even in the role of a deacon, I've had one or two men in the past say, I want to be a deacon. And folks, I have a problem with that personally, okay? Because I believe God will tell the, the board of deacons and the deacon body, uh, you know, who are the next candidates and members, and God will also tell me. I, I feel like he will do that. It should not be a place where you feel like you deserve to be a deacon. Folks, I am telling you as I'm standing behind this pulpit, I do not feel like I deserve to be behind this pulpit. One of the reasons I relate to Paul so much is because there was a time in my life for two years, even though I raised in church, even though I went to church, my first 18 years, every time the doors were open, I walked away from God for two years, all right? And I finally came back to him when I was 22 years old. And still to this day, I'm just telling you, I, I just thank God that his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness uh, found my life personally. And that's what Paul was saying. You need to do this with humility and with many tears and trials. Folks, let me say this. I grow more in the trials than I do in the good times. Because in the good times, I'm thinking... Hey, things are going good. It's just, let's just coast along. Let's just take it easy for a while. But folks, those trials drive me to Jesus. Those trials drive me to the Word of God. Those trials drive me to my knees and in my personal prayer closet. So, and, and one of the things I believe is missing in our New Testament church is tears. Folks, I have been in services, I kid you not, where there was wailing and, and regret because of sin in someone's life. I've seen it where the altar has been just totally full of people during revival times, getting right with the Lord, not caring who was sitting in the sanctuary, not caring what somebody else will, you know, will think of them. And Paul was saying this. He was saying, listen, I'm going to be leaving you. All right? You can almost compare him to Jesus. Not, he wasn't perfect. I'm just saying Jesus' ministry to the disciples was doing the same thing. He was telling them, I got to go. I got to go. And he was really indicating that this will probably be my last time I will see you. And, and, and we'll explain that in just a minute. Look at verse 20. How I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. He started out in synagogues. You remember every town that he went in. And then basically he gets thrown out of synagogues because he'd debate the Jews and he would, just, he would just make them look bad. So they would make him leave the synagogues. Then he went to the school of Tyrrhenius. All right. And he did that. All right. For three months. But then what he did, he started investing in these elders, these, uh, you know, these, these leaders, these church leaders, church staff. And what they did was go from house to house. They put folks in the houses and they would have house groups. And folks, that's kind of what we do with Sunday school, with Sunday school. And it says, verse 21, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, 
repentance towards God, and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, if everything we do and everything we do should point people to Jesus Christ. Our whole reason for existence is evangelism. Christ died for the church. And it is the church's responsibility to evangelize and to testify and to share the gospel with every, everyone. So we see him saying and reviewing the past ministry. Three years he was in Ephesus. No other place had he spent more time. No other place had he got any closer to this bunch. No other place had he seen ministry that was going on, folks, in a pagan town. A pagan town. A church was planted, and it was thriving. And he was, he was giving these, these leaders the charge. I'm going, and you folks have to step up. You have to step up for our Lord and Savior. Hold your finger there and go to uh, Ephesians 6 for me. Go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verse 5. Ephesians 6, 5. Bond servants. 17 times in Paul's epistles, he used the word bond servants. 17 times. He called himself, in many of the introductions, a bond servant. And a bond servant, folks, was a slave. Okay? We haven't arrived spiritually. We aren't the best gift God has ever given this church or uh, America, all right? That's arrogance, folks. We are bond slaves. We are sold out to Jesus Christ. We are here to live for Jesus Christ. He tells us what to do. Be obedient to those who your masters according to the flesh. Now, you can make two analogies here. One is employer-employee uh, you know, uh, uh, relationships. Okay, you can do that. The application is employer-employee relationships. And folks, we need to be good employees. We need to work hard at what we do. They need to be able to trust us and to believe us and know that when we punched the clock and we said we worked eight hours one day, we worked eight hours that day. But it also can apply spiritually to our relationship to God. Folks, he's our boss. He's the commander. He is the chief, all right? Who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. What is fear? Respect. Respect. We need to respect God. Respect God. I love it when I'm uh, at part of a, a funeral procession and I see this more in the country than I see anywhere else. I see a man pull off the road in his pickup truck and he's got a straw hat and he'll take that pickup or that hat off and he'll stop what he's doing and put his, his hat over his heart in respect for the family. Folks, that's the respect we need to have for others. That's the respect we need to have for God. Fear and respect. Trembling means honor. It is honor. We are honoring God in sincerity of heart. We don't serve God from our head, folks. It's not a head business. It's the heart. God changes the heart. Your heart needs to be in it. Your heart needs to be sold out to Jesus Christ. As to Christ, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Oh, you know how some people are at work. When the bosses come by, man, you straighten up and you act like you're busy. Well, when they go to lunch and you're there, you know, you're on the computer, or you're on your phone. Folks, it shouldn't be that way. The same thing is true. Let me ask you a question. When in life am I not a preacher? When am I in life not the pastor of Rye Hill Baptist Church? Everywhere I go, everything I do, on vacation, I'm a reflection of God in a Rye Hill Baptist Church. And that's what he's saying. Don't do it when somebody's watching, all right? Do it because it's the right thing to do because you need to please God in everything you do. Doing the will of God from the heart. Folks, it's not punching the clock ministry. What are you doing today? Oh, I guess I'll go to church today. Oh, I guess I'll sing today. Well, 
I really didn't like all the ones that Steve chose. You know, there, there was enough. Folks, we shouldn't care. We should praise the Lord in our hearts. And by the way, Steve, I like all your music, okay? I like it all, all right? Just in case somebody had a crazy thought in their head. Folks, we're here to worship God. We're here to talk to God. We're here to hear the Word of God. And worship comes from the heart. With goodwill doing service as the Lord, as to the Lord and not to men. We're not showing off. Oh, wasn't the prime example when the disciples were outside the synagogue and all these people were passing through at the end? It's exactly what we'll be doing today. They're standing back there with the bag, uh, the bag, the money bag. And these rich guys and these rich people are just tossing all kinds of monies in there. And Jesus looks at them and says, this woman came by, poor, threw two pennies in. And it was a teachable moment. And he was saying, she gave more than everyone that has passed by. See, those who are rich, you throw in you know, bigger money, hey folks, it's, it's proportionate to what you're making. And I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm saying, Jesus was saying, she gave everything. Her whole life saved. Everything that she had, she put it in there. And what did it tell you about that person? What did it tell you about that lady? She trusted God. She trusted God. Don't do it to show off. Verse 8, knowing that whatever good one does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Let me give you a quick, just one sentence. You can't outgive God. You can't do it, folks. God will bless you if you obey in giving. And, and I'm just telling you, folks, giving is a part of worship. We do it in worship. You know, so many times in our lives, we, we have what I call the spiritual resumes. You know, somebody will talk to us, and we'll give them a list of everything that we have done. But folks, the true test of servanthood is not a stars, it is scars. I'll say it again. A true test of servanthood is not stars, it is scars. Paul bore the scars of ministry. Paul was beaten. Paul was thrown into prison. Paul was shipwrecked. You can just see the list of things. And folks, sometimes people just live in past ministry where we need to live for today. Live for today. So we see a review of the past. We see a testimony of the present. Look at verse 22. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. Why was he going to Jerusalem? They told him not to go there. His friends told him he shouldn't go there, and we're going to cover that next week. Not knowing the things that will happen to me, except that the Spirit testifies in every city, saying, chains and tribulations await me. What's he saying? Wherever he went, there was opposition. Wherever he went, there was persecution. And you know what? He didn't back up. He didn't, you know, shut up. He didn't give up. He knew what was going to happen. And they told him, man, if you go there, you're going to be in trouble. And he said twice, the Holy Spirit told me to go. Folks, I got news for you. If the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you need to do it. Doesn't matter what others think. See, a lot of times we start polling people. Polling. Well, what do you think? Well, what do you think? Well, you know, all that matters is what God thinks. God thinks. That's all that matters because he knows what's going to happen. The Spirit told him, you are going to be arrested. You are going to be in chains. Verse 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Why was he being arrested? For preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. For telling the truth from the word of God. For going against the system and the religions the religious folks of that day. And he basically said, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care if I'm persecuted. I don't care if I'm thrown in jail. I don't even care if they take my life. 
God has told me through the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, and that is exactly what I'm doing. Because you know what the folks at Ephesus wanted? Paul, couldn't you just stay one more year? Couldn't you just help us one more? Just one more year, and then I think we'll be okay. But folks, there is a time. There is a time to leave. There is a time. And that time is when the Holy Spirit tells you to go. Verse 25, and indeed now uh, I know that you of all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. And I'm telling you, about this time, their mouths started dropping. About this time, they understood what this last meeting was about. About this time, they were thinking, oh my goodness, how can we do without Paul? How can we do? How can we do? Kind of reminds me of the old days when J. Harold Smith was a preacher. And Steve and I have talked about that. Wouldn't you like to follow J. Harold Smith and his ministry? I'm telling you, folks, I'm telling you, if God told us to do it as ministers, that's exactly what we need to do. Doesn't matter what J. Harold did. God has placed the next person in line. And Paul was just saying, man, I got to go. You guys are the ones. You're going to pick up my mantle. I have taught you. Folks, Paul worked hard. Paul worked night and day. He didn't take days off. All right? You just look at his life and you could see that. Verse 26, Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have, for I, for I have not shunned to declare you the whole counsel of God. What did he say? I have preached the kingdom of God. You know what he's saying? My, there, there will be no man's blood on my hands. What does that say? Everyone he came in contact to, he either preached to them or he witnessed to them about the love of Jesus Christ. If you look back in Ezekiel, and you know the, the uh, importance of a watchman. That watchman was the one that was on the walls at nighttime. And there were watchmen in the day. But most enemies just didn't come right through the gates in daytime. They snuck around in the dark. And folks, that is a perfect example of Satan. Satan sneaks around and wants to take Christians and wants to, you know, uh, intimidate Christians. And we, as leaders, are God's watchmen. Folks, I will not apologize for telling you the truth of God's Word. I will not apologize for telling you what God says, thus saith the Lord. And I know in my heart of hearts, it's going to get hard later on, folks. They're going to want to censor my sermons. They're going to want to tell me what I can say and what I cannot say. And folks, it's not going to happen. I can preach in a jail. I can do that. Folks, that's exactly what Paul did. And Paul is simply saying, hey, listen. And folks, I don't know too many men or women that say there are no blood on my hands. That's the depth in which Paul shared the gospel with others. That's the depth of his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hold your finger there and go to Philippians 1. Philippians 1. Verse 19. Philippians 1, 19, he's writing to the church at Philippi. For I know that this will turn out for, uh, out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Folks, three things will get you through any situation in life. All right? He says prayer, prayer will get you through any situation in life. The second thing he talks about is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is that comforter. Folks, there's a lot of times I have no clue why this happens to people. There's things that happen to me. I have no clue why that happened. But it's not for me to try to guess the answer. It is for me to keep walking and keep trusting and keep loving and keep staying committed to God. And the third thing is the prayer and the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Why do you think Psalms was written? They are songs of comfort. Why do you think Proverbs were written? All right? It's advice.
to young people. Why do you think Romans were written? It explains salvation. Everywhere. Why do you think Genesis was written? Because we didn't, it wasn't the Big Bang Theory, folks. It was creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything we are, everything that we stand for comes from the Word of God. And if you have those three things, you can make it. Paul proved that. And I am telling you, he went through much, 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 much more than we'll ever go through in our lifetime. Verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always. So now Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or whether by death. I had a preacher over in Alma. He since is deceased. He's an elder. He was in his 80s. And he gave a devotion to some senior adults that I'll never forget. And you know what the title of it was? Don't die before you're dead. Think about that. It's not a joke. Think about that. Don't die before you're dead. Folks, I'm going to go out swinging. (laughs) I'm going to go out on top. I'm going to go out singing hallelujah. And that's what he's saying. He's just saying, folks, keep doing it. There's not a retirement aging aging Christian. Because I keep saying I'm going to stay here until I retire. And when I say that, I'm simply saying if I get where I repeat myself all the time and, you know, I get to where I you know, can't get up on the steps, you know, and I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm simply saying, yeah, there is a time for some, but I, I, you know what I'll do? I'll go out to those little churches out in Oklahoma or those little churches in Arkansas that run about 20 or 25, and I'm telling you, you can just walk in. There will be no stairs because you can just walk in and preach, all right? Honestly. I would love to be standing behind a pulpit, an older gentleman, gentleman, and just pass. Now, the crowd wouldn't feel real good about that, but, but I would think, man, this, this is cool, God. This is cool. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I will do this until I die. 21, very much quoted scripture, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, you can't live until you have taken care of death. You can't have that joy unless you know that when you die, you're going to heaven. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Folks, I don't want a service where everybody just boo-hooed and cried and all this is going on. I want a praise service when I go because I'll be, watch, I'll be walking the streets of gold. Verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two, having desired to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Folks, God will use you. Man, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't retire on Christianity. God will use you till the day you die. So we see a review of the past, a testimony of the present, and then a warning about the future. Verse 28. 28. Therefore, I take, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Folks, I am a pastor. A pastor is a shepherd. Uh, you are the flock, the Rye Hill Baptist flock. And part of my job is to take care of you. Also, I am not just a pastor. I am a preacher. I am a proclaimer of the word of God. And that's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, I know you've been hearing me preach for three years, but now it's your time. Now it's your time. Verse 29, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Folks, look at the language here. He could have just said wolves. He said savage wolves. 
He's talking about liars. He's talking about people that are teaching false doctrine. He's talking about people who are on power trips. He's talking about people that want a congregation, that need that congregation to make them feel good. That's what he's talking about. And folks, in that town of Ephesus, they were there. Matter of fact, in his writing later on to Timothy, he warned the people of Ephesus, I told you so, I told you, because they were infiltrating the church. Folks, I will say this. If there is a teacher, which there has not been in my 17 years, a teacher teaching false doctrine in one of our Sunday school classes, I will speak to them, and they will stop or they will leave our church. That's the only two options. We teach the Word of God. The Word of God. The doctrine of God. Folks, doctrine is everything. It's who we are. It's what we believe. Verse 30, also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Numbers, they like a following. They like that. Therefore, watch and remember, for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. He says that. Again, the word tears. That's tears in his prayer closets. That's tears when he prayed with someone. That's tears when he was laying in his bed at night and thinking about somebody that may have been taken away from the flock. And he would go and he would talk to them and he would try to bring them back. Verse 32, so now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Preach the word is what he was saying. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. He was a, 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 a tent maker by trade. He was. But also, uh, folks, uh, he was a teacher and a leader. And it's not wrong to, to, to pay, pay, you know, folks, uh, salaries and things like that. But that should not be the motive of church leaders the motive is jesus christ jesus christ the motive is working working every day every day putting in the time and hours verse 35 i have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the lord jesus when he said it is more blessed to give than receive i find it interesting this is the only place that Jesus has quoted this quote in the Gospels. The only place. Why? It goes back to the offering that Paul was taking. He was taking that offering for Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ. He was going to help those Jews out because there was such persecution. They lost their jobs. Some had to walk away from families. Their families left them because they became Christians. And folks, I'm telling you, if he's quoting Jesus, that is a good person to quote. And folks, that's what we're doing today. The offering at the end of the service is helping somebody in need. Folks, I have been praying for weeks about this. Not days. Weeks. And we are blessed of God to be a blessing for others. Verse 36, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. All. And they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Can you imagine the farewell that day? Can you imagine the emotion that day? Could you imagine, folks, it was almost as if Paul had died. Because he said, man, I'm going to Jerusalem. And folks, we know also he wanted to go to Rome. So he was probably never going to pass this way again. One of the hardest things I ever did in my life was, was leave my home church. I'd been a church member there for 36 years. I was raised in Cameron Baptist Church. I'd been in youth ministry for 16 years. And the hardest thing was to leave Cameron Baptist Church, my home church, where I was comfortable, where the church grew. Folks, 
in 10 years, it grew from 350 to over 1,100 people every Sunday. And I got to be a part of that. And I'll never forget the fellowship going away. I, I cried and cried and cried till I couldn't cry anymore. Because after the fellowship, Satan started getting on me and saying, man, did you make the right decision? Did you make the right decision? Even though I knew in my heart of hearts, the only person, the only family I knew in Alma, Arkansas, was Bob Shelton and his family. But God told me to go. He told me to go. And I can relate to what Paul is saying. Folks, I'm telling you, when you do ministry, you connect with people. I still go. It's been 17 years. Two weeks ago, I went to First Baptist at Alma and preached a funeral service for somebody that went to church with us and, and really came in about the same time as us. And folks, what I'm saying is, what broke my heart more than anything was people that said this in two of the, both of the places that I left. I know you're out of God's will. And it broke my heart because I knew I was in God's will. Folks, I'm telling you, the hard thing for Paul was, I want to stay, but I have to go. I have to go. And folks, I am telling you, you need to follow the Holy Spirit. Don't listen to the polls and don't listen to the crowd. Don't listen to people around you. You do exactly what God tells you to do. 2 Timothy 4, and I close with this. 2 Timothy 4. Beautiful scripture. I mean, absolute amazing. 2 Timothy 4.1. Preach the word. I mean, I could stop right there. I could stop right there, but it, we have to go on. Be ready in season and out of season convince, rebuke, exhort with long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctor, doctrine. And by the way, the time has come. We're living in the time where doctrine is not important to people anymore. Because they have itching ears and they will heap up on themselves teachers. See, there's some folks that say, well, I don't want to hear about my sin." Well, what it tells me is, one, is you're not listening to God because he'll, he'll tell you about it. Second thing is you're not reading God's Word because He'll tell you about it. Folks, I want somebody that will be truthful with me. And it's the truth of the Word of God. And they will turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside into fables. Fable is a, is a, uh, a story, a made-up story is a fable. But you, be watchful in all things, this is Paul. Endure afflictions. Do the work of, of an evangelist. Save people is the number one thing in church and fulfill your ministry. Everyone here has a ministry for God. Everyone needs to be doing something for God. And we'll be talking about that in the months to come. For I am now ready to be offered as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Oh, folks, can you say that in your heart of hearts today? Have you fought the good fight? Have you finished the race? Have you kept the faith? Oh, listen, folks. The only thing I want to hear from God when I cross, you know, I don't think it's going to be a review thing. When I cross that threshold, all I want God to say is, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I pray, I pray to God, that is your desire today. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord, that is your greatest need right now. You think it's a financial need or you think it's a relation, relationship need. No, the, the, the greatest thing you need is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It changes everything. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Man, what, what text, what a scripture. And God, as, as we get grow older, God, it, it is, I think, more and more 
about heaven. And God, I pray, my first prayer is that everybody here is going there. But God, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray they would just get up out of their seat, out of their seat and come to you, God. I pray that they would come to this altar. Lord, we'll show them, we'll tell them how they can be saved. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray that we would be sold out. God, I pray that we would not take days off. Uh, God, I pray that we would just share our testimony in the gospel with everyone we come in contact with. God, thank you. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for our time of invitation. Lord, maybe Christians need to rededicate their lives. Maybe they just need to come and pray in this altar and go back to their seat. Or maybe some need to come for baptism. Or Lord, even church membership. God, this is your church. This is your church. I pray they do what you tell them to do. And God will be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?